Remind us that God blesses us more than we could ever count, more than you look up in the heavens, and, and we are just so blessed. And, um, and our next, the, the, and intergenerational means that every, the whole church is invited to a Sunday school lesson, and we'll do a craft together, we'll do a lesson together, which we will all benefit from, and then we'll have a take-home thing. So right now, um, every night, we are we did something for families to bless each other you bless your spouse you bless your children you bless yourself a physical blessing we taught at that first one and we'll do another one and that's october 24th at nine o'clock so i hope you'll come and then on that same day sunday october 24th we have our annual weenie roast and um it's a very big deal here at this church (laughs) so i hope you'll come it's at four o'clock we will be in the next couple of Sundays donning the Trinity Lutheran Church Weenie Meister. And um, so it could happen to anybody. I have the Weenie costume in the church. And whoever gets donned the Weenie Meister, the rule is you have to come dressed as the Weenie Meister. And there's, you can't get out of it. So you can't say, oh, I'm, I'm uh, hopping on a plane to Zimbabwe. That's too bad. Change your flights. Well, I, I can't help you. It's rules are rules. We don't make them, we just follow them. So, um, so I hope you'll um, come prepared. Um, and we've got the weenie poles, we've got the, um, a fire marshal, a trinity fire marshal that day who's gonna tend the fire and it's gonna be a fun. We're saying everyone come in costume, especially the kids will have games and prizes and spooky things, it'll be fun. And November 7th, this just came up. So if you are running an event on that morning, whether it's a small group, a class, Sunday school, faith group, Bible study, whatever, for that Sunday morning, November 7th, um, we are having one worship service on November 7th at 10 o'clock, and it won't be here. It'll be at First Congregational Church. It's a town-wide ecumenical service. They've invited us for the final service of the Reverend Ken Peterkin, who was the pastor of that church for 17 years. They've invited us all to participate. I think that, like, full participation, I think the choir, I got the sense the choir is going to be invited to sing with them. Our musicians are going to be invited to play. Um, some people are going to be invited to do readings and prayers and things like that. So it's uh, the, all the churches in town are going to be there. Many of the churches in town are going to be there. And I hope you will come. It's a big deal when a pastor of that long in this town leaves and especially for that church who's going to be going into a transition time. Um, And I hope you'll come and support them. So so don't come here on November 7th unless your small group will have conversations. Is going to run here at 9 o'clock, and then we'll drive over it for 10 o'clock service. We'll talk about that within your group. But, okay, that's what I have for, for announcements. Tina has an announcement. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you will uh, consider singing. It's a great group. That's all that I have for worship. Let us worship. uh, No, that's not all I have for worship. That's all I have for announcements. Let us worship God Almighty. That'd be a very short service. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, 
one God whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but by the grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Our gathering hymn is hymn 532. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to what lies ahead, we may follow the way of your commandments and receive the crown of everlasting joy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
You may be seated for the readings. The first reading is from Amos. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they amber the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from their levies of grain, you have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vine vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. Just as you have said, hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Word of God, word of life. The second reading is from Psalm 90. We will read responsively. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Return, O Lord. How long will you turn? Be gracious to your servants. Satisfy us by your steadfast love. In the morning, so shall we rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you afflicted us and as many years as you suffered. Show your servants your works and your splendor to their children. Please rise as you're able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel this Sunday is according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother and father. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. <clears throat> when the man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded. And said to one another, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. 
And Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, and children and fields with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning, church. What would you do if this morning, after worship, um, you took a walk and you, I know some of you are from Old Saybrook, you went down to the beach, you went down back behind the water, you went down on Main Street, wherever your place is, wherever your special place is, and you, you encountered him. He showed up for you, the resurrected living Christ, just like, just like Thomas, and he had his, his wounds. He said, put your finger here in my side, put your finger here in my hands, in my feet. And there was no doubt for you, it was, it was him, it was the living one. Would you ask a similar question? Because I feel like it's a good question. Good teacher, what, what must I do to get into heaven? <laughs> I feel like that's a reason a lot of people come to church. I mean, it's probably not the reason we should come to church, but I feel like it's the reason a lot of people go to church. What do I got to do to get into heaven? And that's, that's the question. That's the story today. The man goes up to Jesus and he falls on his knees and he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus runs down the list, the commandments. Honor your mother and father, don't kill, don't steal, don't cheat, don't commit adultery. It's good stuff, right? And, and, um, and the man cuts him off and he says, hey, l- listen, I, I, I got you since I, was a, a, since I was a kid. I followed all these, somehow, somehow this guy followed all these commandments, right? And since I was a kid, I've done it all perfectly. And, and Jesus, the text says, and this is important, it says, loved him. When he spoke these words, it says he loved him when he said this. He says, you have done these, but you, have, you haven't done everything. He says, then, then do this. To get in heaven, to gain eternal life, you must sell all your possessions and give to the poor and follow me. So we're back to our hypothetical, and you're down on the beach in Old Saybrook. You're wherever, you're, wherever your place is, your holy place sacred place, that you encounter divine things, and you encounter the divine thing, the resurrected Christ. And he says to you this thing, you say, what do, Christ, what do I have to do to get into heaven? I miss my mom, I miss my dad, I miss my spouse. What do I have to do? And he says this exact phrase, he says, you've done good, but you have to go back home, put your house on the market, you have to empty your bank account, you have to sell everything, And come walk with me. Follow me. Reflect right now. What would you do? What would you do? Anyone would take him up on that offer? Okay. Great. Okay, great. So we have one taker. <laughs> then let me ask this question. Then, um, I, I'm gonna. This is our our adult confirmation teacher, right? <laughs> not to put her on the spot. But then, why haven't you? This is not a hypothetical, right? Here's my question. Um, 
Every time we open up the scriptures, it says we encounter the living Christ. It's not a hypothetical. We open up the Bible, we read his words, we encounter the living Christ, not the dead Christ. Every time the scripture says, where two or three gather in my name, I am with you. It says, every time you take of my flesh and drink of my blood, I am with you. The sacrament, when you receive the sacrament, you receive the living presence of Christ. It's not a hypothetical, so we want to know, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? What must I do to get to heaven? And the scriptures, the Lord commands it. Here it is. His own words. Not a dead word, a living word. Christ himself says, here you are. Sell all your possessions, give them to the poor, and follow me. So what do we do with this? I'll, I'll try. That's a better answer. <laughs> I'm going to, okay? But this is what, in actuality, this is what we do. All of us, right? This is what we do. We try to justify what we, what we actually, how we live. This is this is what we do, right? We say, well, unlike others, I have worked for everything I have. I've worked for it. Unlike other people, they haven't worked for it. I've worked for what I have. Or I, uh, I'm not rich. I'm not rich. Have you driven through Greenwich or Fairfield County? Have you gone to some places in California? There's people going into space who aren't even astronauts now. Like, hello? We say, I've earned what I have, or I don't have as much as others. And you know what? You don't have to justify that, because it's true. A hundred percent. Stop justifying yourselves. It's true. But here's the problem. It completely misses the point of what Jesus is teaching here. Because what it does is it refocuses on what Jesus is trying to do and puts it back on ourselves, which is, by the way, what we are really good at doing as human beings. We're really good at loving on ourselves and making everything about ourselves. But Jesus is taking the attention away from ourselves and putting it on someone else. The text is not about us. We think that the teaching is for us and like somehow giving away all of our stuff is about us and like maybe it's supposed to be like the meaning is about for us to grow closer in our relationship with God. That's also justification. Or maybe it's not really about uh, how much we give. It's about, uh, about being more generous. That's also justification. Or it's about being closer to God. Or, or, and maybe all that's in true in part. But it's not about us. It's about the poor. They're the central focus for Christ in this. And oftentimes in all of Scripture. So much of these teachings, whether we go all the way back to the prophets, like in the teaching of Amos or Micah or Hosea, or, or any of the teachings in the Torah, the law of God in the Torah, or the teachings of Christ, so much of what God is trying to teach in the Scriptures is about how much God loves the poor. And, and what Jesus is doing today and so much of the scripture is trying to reorient us and our hearts to love the poor the way God loves the poor. So when we try to justify the texts, what we're doing is taking the focus away from the poor and putting it back on ourselves again. And we end up in this cycle of sin, again, unintentionally, but that's what we're doing. Taking the focus away from the God's love of the poor and the need and care and compassion for the poor and putting it back on ourselves, because that's what we do. And we miss the point. And it's why when Jesus says to the man, who, by the way, does it say he's, he's rich? He's not, it doesn't even say he's rich. It's implied maybe that he has some wealth, but it doesn't say he's rich. In other texts, it says there's other rich men. Not here. It doesn't say he's rich. It says he has a lot of possessions. By the way, can anyone here relate to having too much stuff? Great. Okay, so there's justification again. We say he's rich. He doesn't even say he's rich. It says he's got too much stuff. So when Jesus says to sell his possessions, it, it's not about Christian minimalism or, or there's no teaching. It's not about decluttering his life or, or, or uh, decluttering to God to make room for prayer or to get rid of distraction, etc. That might be a byproduct of getting rid of all of your stuff to give to the poor. It said, go and sell your stuff and give the money to the poor, not to charity, not to environmental groups, not to animal rescue groups. By the way, those are all great. You should give to those if that's your passion. 
I'm not saying to not give to those, but God's focus and God's priority and God's heart is for the poor. And so we have this sense that when, the, when Jesus is rattling off the, the, the commandments and the man is like, yeah, 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 I've done all that. By the way, he doesn't get through all the commandments, does he? Jesus doesn't get to all the commandments that the guy says, I followed them all since my youth. He forgets a big one. And we get the sense that he hasn't actually followed all the commandments since his youth. Because when he walks away and it says he's not able to do this, where we get the assumption he's not able to do this, he cannot give up the things his stuff for the poor. He can't sell his stuff for the poor. That he's probably violating the first commandment. He's probably violating it. Do you remember what the first commandment is? Have no other God before me. And when you love your stuff more than you love somebody who is sick, who doesn't have enough food to eat, who doesn't have enough health care, who doesn't have a place to sleep at night, when you have lots of cash in your wallet, but somebody who says they need food and you give them a dollar and it's not enough for a sandwich, you probably love your stuff more than you love the poor. And the scripture says to love God and love neighbor. They're equal, which means you have violated the first commandment. And Luther says, which is why Luther sometimes is a jerk and sometimes he's brilliant. And when Luther says, I cannot ever follow the will of God, I cannot ever keep any of the commandments because I can't even follow the first commandment because I turned myself into an idol. He's absolutely right. So the, so Jesus says this teaching, you have to give all your stuff to the poor. And, and, and all the disciples are standing there in awe and they can't make sense of it. And they say, appropriately, they question, they say, well then who can be saved? And there's only one proper response to that. For mortals, it is impossible. It is impossible. You will always choose yourself. We all will. But for God, Jesus says, for God, all things are possible. Not with God, he says, for God. So he teaches a little bit more, and this is why the next set of verses are just as important, and I wish it was in today's reading. It's not. But if you keep reading a little bit more, Jesus goes on. They, they walk a little further, and then he keeps teaching them. The next thing Jesus teaches is what's called the messianic secret. And we talked about this in a, a few sermons ago, a few weeks ago. It was in a chapter ago, Mark 9:31. And it happened again in Mark 8, 31. Now we're in Mark 10, 33. What does he say? He tells him, essentially, I am the Messiah. I've come into the world. I will be betrayed. I will be handed over to authorities. I will be beaten. And I will die. But I will rise again. Because Jesus knows us. He knows we need a Savior. He knows we cannot rely on ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot do the will of God that he asks. We cannot save other people on our own. If Jesus, the living Christ, were here today telling us exactly what we need to do to inherit our own eternal life, we still wouldn't do it. And how do we know? Because he is here today, gathered in this embodied community, in the scriptures, telling us what we need to do to inherit eternal life. And there was one person lying to us, and she's the confirmation teacher, telling us she would do it, and she's not doing it. Oh, yeah. And she's lying to us. We cannot save ourselves. That is... The crux of this text, we can't do it. For mortals, it is impossible. We need to fall on our knees at the cross. We need a savior. So Jesus comes. He gives his life for us. He does something that he himself doesn't even want to do. 
at Gethsemane, after, right before he's about to be betrayed, right before he's about to fulfill what he says in, in this messianic secret in Mark 10, 33, when he gets to the end of the gospel, and he's, he's in Gethsemane, and he says, Lord, take this cup away from me, please, unless it's your will. And of course, it is the will of God. Then thy will be done. He begs for it not to happen because nobody wants to go to a cross and, be, and sacrifice themselves for their sins. But he does it. He who is first, the Son of God, makes himself last, giving everything he has, sacrificing himself. He dies on the cross that he takes our sin, all the ways that we fall short, all the ways we cannot do what God tells us to do. Even knowing the consequences and the cost, we still can't do it. He takes our sin and exchanges for us instead his righteousness and grants us salvation, eternity in heaven. So when we ask that question, how do I get to be with my father and my mother who I miss, my spouse, my child? He's already answered it for us. And then he frees us from that guilt. So when we stand up at the beginning of service and I says, I... God forgives you of all of your sins. He means it. He means it. So when we read the scripture today and he says, give all of your stuff to the poor, and we say, we can't. He says, okay, I forgive you. And he frees us from our guilt so that we can do what? So that we can leave and serve the poor. So that we can strive then to do the will of God. So that we can strive then to imitate Christ. So that we can wake up today more generous than we woke up yesterday. And if we don't, we can repent and try again tomorrow. And when we don't, wake up the next day, repent, and try again. That's what repentance is and the forgiveness of God is. Does Christ know that we won't give everything we have to the poor? Yes. Does Christ want us to give everything we have to the poor? Yes. Jesus means what he says in the scripture. Will he love us all the same today? Yes. And there is a word for it. It's grace. Unending, undeserving, limitless, and amazing. And so let us bearers of that good news say together, Amen.
continue with the Apostles' Creed found on page 105, beginning of the hymnal. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again, living in the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Prayers of the people. I will read the first and the last petition, and you are invited to read any of the following out loud as the Spirit moves you. Made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Uniting God, you call forth different gifts in those who follow you. Encourage us to welcome the diverse benefits and blessings of the whole church in teaching, preaching, prophecy, healing, and more. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For what else or who else need our prayers today? We give thanks for the birth of Rhea. We pray for Edna and her recovery after a fall. Eternal God, we thank you for the lives of those who have died. Make us confident in your promise of salvation and support as in our own journey of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, in those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let's take a moment to share a sign of peace with each other as you're comfortable.
Let us together pray. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Behold. Holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and the suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus gathered his disciples, and he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he blessed it. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take this, all of you, and eat, for this bread is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he gave thanks to God. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take this, all of you, and drink, because this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. And we ask, O oh God, that you pour out upon us the spirit of your love and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ our Lord to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And here at Trinity, we celebrate an open table, because we believe that Christ is living, and he welcomes all people to this sacrament. And if you wish to receive it, if you feel called to receive it, we will not put a, anything to block you away. So this is the gift of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
And now, church, may the true presence of Christ our Savior, which we have now received, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go forth singing our final hymn, hymn 471.